so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Before you get into today's episode, we want to give you the heads up. It does contain descriptions of child sexual assault, abuse, suicide and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Jim has been in an orphanage since he was four years old. After his mother died, his father abandoned him. Now nine years old, timid little Jim has been beaten so badly that he's bleeding through his clothes onto the seat at his classroom desk. His hands are so bruised he can barely write. Jim was disciplined by the strict nuns who were meant to be his caregivers. This latest beating was because he tried sticking up for his friend, another little boy who wet the bed, and as punishment, had his soiled sheets tied tightly around his neck. He was forced to walk through the halls of the orphanage as the other children were told to laugh at him. (laughs) Trish is eight years old. Every time she's deemed to have misbehaved, the nuns pull one of her teeth out as punishment. Joseph is afraid of the dark. It's when bad things happen to him, at the hands of the grown-ups who were entrusted with his care. Helen is force-fed gruel each morning by a nun who shoves food in her mouth until she can't breathe. She's then forced to eat her own vomit. Sally is six years old. She's beaten daily. Sometimes she's locked away in a small container inside an attic for hours at a time. It's too short for her to sit up straight, but too narrow to lay down flat. Sally's every day is filled with some kind of abuse or horror. I saw somebody push a boy out the window. I knew it was a nun because she had to have it. Any kind of hit and bounce. Well, I guess you'd call it, it was a bounce. And then he laid still. When Sally's not being pulled by her hair into one of the beds of the Sisters of Providence, she's praying her eyes have played tricks on her, that the things she's seen couldn't possibly be real. All I really want is an honest apology and for them to come face to face with me, tell me these things did happen, and that would they please, if at all possible, never let it happen to children again. I'm Emma Gillespie, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, impoverished populations within urban areas were struggling to keep up with the rising number of abandoned children. With many unable to put food on the table, parents would often be left with no option than to surrender their children to local orphanages in the hopes that these homes could provide more for their kids than they were able to. A warm bed and a good feed. With little support or infrastructure in the way of social and government services, the responsibility to house these children fell largely on local parishes. By the 1950s, residential homes for these abandoned children, owned and operated by the Catholic Church, were rife, both here in Australia and throughout the United States. The image of these grand manors, large estates surrounded by manicured lawns, of a safe space for innocent children, could not have been further from the truth of what was occurring behind closed doors. It would take several decades before the atrocities that unfolded within these church-led homes would begin to come to light, thanks to the bravery of those willing to share their accounts of abuse and remarkable survival. Journalist Christine Keneally extensively investigated the secret horrors hidden deep within Catholic orphanages in the US and here in Australia throughout the 1900s. 
until as recently as the 60s and 70s. Her book, Ghosts of the Orphanage, exposes the shocking violence, abuse and deaths that took place in these homes. She joins us now. Christine, you've written extensively on orphanages, two orphanages in particular, St John's here in Australia, St Joseph's in Burlington, Vermont, the US. What can you tell me about those places? What did they have in common? You know, I think of the entire system as like a gulag, as this sort of connected almost geography, really. And it was populated by these large, dark buildings. They were often two, three, sometimes four stories high, many windows. There was often an attic and a basement. And inside these places, there were the dormitories that the kids would sleep in, you know, sometimes 10, 20 beds to a room. There were the collective eating areas and spaces. And many of the orphanages had schools inside them as well. So that some kids never left the properties at all for all the time that they were there. They ate, they slept, and they went to school inside these single buildings. What I think is most extraordinary about these orphanages in these very different places is how much they did have in common. So they were part of this 20th century orphanage system and the kids inside these places fundamentally knew more about each other's lives than the lives of kids who lived outside the orphanages, sort of in the neighborhood, you know, on the streets of their local areas. There was this sameness in terms of the daily life of these kids, but there was also this incredible sameness in terms of these hidden secret, dark aspects of these places as well. Now, I focus primarily on Catholic orphanages, and of course, there's a sameness in that as well. But orphanages in the 20th century were run by many different religions and also by states as well. And how did a child end up at one of these orphanages? Was there a typical profile or age group? Yeah, well, what's so fascinating about that question is that ironically, often why a child ended up there was not because they were an orphan, even though these places were called orphanages. It was actually really rare for a child to have lost both of their parents. There certainly were cases like that, but that wasn't the common denominator. What really most of these kids had in common was poverty or some aspect of poverty in the way it was impacting on their family. So it was often the case that one of their parents had died or disappeared or was incapacitated in some way. So there might have been illness, their dad might have gone to war, their mom might have been ill. There was some way in which the family was compromised and was finding it hard to cope often financially and in other ways as well. And in some of these Catholic families, you know, there were just so many kids, there were too many mouths to feed. I heard the story a number of times that, you know, the parish priest would come along and sort of say to the mom, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, you need some help. Why don't you send some of your kids to the local orphanage? They'll get a good education. They'll get fed. As far as the kids themselves that ended up there, you know, they could have been anywhere from zero. I spoke to people who opened the front door of the orphanage and found a baby there in a box, a newborn baby. That happened all over the world and that happened numerous times in different orphanages. Apart from that, you might find a whole group of siblings going in at the same time, you know, ranging in age from two years old to eight years old or something like that. Probably kids were sent there up until at least maybe 14 or 15 years old. Beyond that, you tended not to get kids entering the orphanage, although there were some people whose tenure at the orphanage was from 10 and even in some rare cases to 20 years. Was there a typical time frame for how long a child might spend there? Were they ever adopted out? Yeah, I think kids rotated in and out of these places. And one of the big challenges of the orphanage system was literally working out how big it was, right? So estimates for Australia were that there were at least half a million children over the 20th century that spent some time in an orphanage. And, you know, it's acknowledged, and that's a federal inquiry estimate, that that's probably a minimum. The estimate that we came at when I was looking at the United States was at least 5 million kids. And again, I think that's a pretty conservative number. So within that group, 
kids might have been in a place for a few weeks at a time for a time of family crisis, might have put them in there temporarily. I think it's more often the case that they would be there for some longer period of time. That might have been six months, that might have been two years, three years. But, you know, kids were there sometimes five years and also above that. That wasn't the most common experience, but it wasn't that uncommon either. I was thinking even about my own grandmother. I know when she was a child growing up in the Depression era in Sydney, her parents had to make a decision to put her and her siblings in an orphanage for, I think, only a few months. But I guess it's hard to imagine in the modern context that we live in that that could have been so commonplace. Does that speak to the era, the financial hardships on families of the day? I think it does. I think it does. And it's really interesting that your grandmother spent some time there too, because I keep having this conversation with people. So for people whose world isn't sort of one degree of separation or super close to that world, I do keep having conversations where people say, oh yes, my grandmother or my great aunt or my great uncle was in a place like that for a time being. The poverty was extraordinary and incredibly challenging for people. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But I think it's not just about the conditions that families found themselves in. It's about the services that were offered at the time. So this was one of the standard services that people were able to avail themselves of or had no other choice but to either send their children there or their children were literally, and this is not uncommon, taken from them and put in these places. That system eventually, slowly, eventually was replaced by the foster care system. So, you know, what you tend to see now when families are in crisis like that as a child might spend time with a foster family or another situation. There was a huge deinstitutionalization movement across the world in the 1970s, and this applied not just to orphanages but to different organizations where people were incarcerated in some way, mental health facilities, places like that, places where people were often involuntarily put for some period of time. But I think we need to be careful about assuming that the systems that replace those systems are actually good for people as well. Focusing in a little bit on St. Joseph's, the orphanage in Vermont in the US that you looked into extensively for your book, What was life like for the boys there? Who was looking after them? What was expected of them? How was the average day spent? It's so interesting because it's such a strange capsule of time and such a strange world with little transparency to the outside. So these organizations were often headed by a priest. That was the person in charge. And then there were often many nuns who did all the actual labor of the place, you know, 10, 20, 30 nuns. And the nuns themselves often ranged in age from 17 or 18 years old, just novices, in many ways children themselves, to women in their 50s or the 60s. The basic day was pretty regimented. You know, kids were awake at the crack of dawn or five or six or something like that. And, you know, it was straight out of their beds and to their knees for morning prayer. Then there would be chapel, then breakfast, and it all happened at the clang of a bell or the clap of some nun's clappers. There would be chores. And for the kids who went to school inside the orphanage, you know, there would be classes inside as well. And there were some really bright spots in these places. You know, kids are kids, no matter what kind of world they're in, they will take happiness where they can. So at St. Joseph's in Burlington, Vermont, the kids went swimming. They were right near a lake. There were team sports. Boxing was really big for boys in those days. There was a lot of organized boxing. There were organized sports. The girls would sing in the choir And there were these sort of amazing moments where the communities from outside the orphanage would come in in some way. I don't know if you remember the singing cowboy Gene Autry. He was pretty huge in the 20th century. Gene Autry and his wonder horse visited the orphanage. The Von Trapp family, who we know from The Sound of Music, were actually neighbours. They visited the orphanage and they sang with the children there. You'd have groups, local groups, like in America it was the Knights of Columbus, where the women in the group would source presents for the children at Christmas time. And then one of the men would dress up as Santa 
and visit the orphanage and there'd be a big to-do and a big celebration and there were moments of beauty as well. People spoke about the nuns processing through the orphanage, each holding a candle and singing hymns on Christmas Eve. But what most people didn't know is that after Santa went away and after the doors were shut, often all those presents were gathered up and taken away from the children again. And the real world of the orphanage, the world that no one from the outside could see, was characterised by these extraordinary aspects of control and of dehumanisation of these children. And I think of these places really as little totalitarian worlds, you know, inside this larger democracy in which the rest of us live. So kids were often given a number when they entered the home. They were addressed as five or 10 or 15. That's how they were called. And they were often given these impossible rules that if they didn't follow them, they were punished. So kids at St. Joseph's were supposed to sleep in a particular position and not move throughout the night. They put their hands in the prayer shape. They clasped their hands in prayer. They were supposed to put their hands upon their pillow and their head upon their hands. And then they were supposed to maintain that position the entire night long while they were asleep. No one, of course, can do anything remotely like that. But the idea that kids could stay in one position all night long is obviously absurd. And yet people remember being woken up because some nun came and hit them in the head or pushed them out of bed because they had failed to hold the position. So there was emotional abuse. The kids were told literally and in a million different ways that they were society's garbage. There was sexual abuse. It was organized. It was pervasive. It was committed by male and female clergy. It was committed by lay workers. And there was physical abuse as well. And the physical abuse ranged from what someone who's a bit older now would recognize as what was for that era, normal corporal punishment, you know, a rap on the knuckles, a whack on the head. And then it extended sort of throughout the whole spectrum to just completely unhinged behavior where children were thrown downstairs, they were held out windows, they were punched with closed fists and there was no recompense. There was no way for them to protect themselves in any way. Who was setting the agenda or tone of this abuse, of this treatment? As you've mentioned, the absurd notion that you could sleep completely still without changing position. Where was that coming from? Was that within the Catholic Church and and the context of its guidance? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And One of the ways we know that is because this kind of thing happened all over the place. It happened in all of these different worlds. What was really fascinating to me as I reported the story and the book was that I was able to get hold of a lot of documents that were internal to the Sisters of Providence, who were the order that ran St. Joseph's in Vermont. And, you know, these documents contained views that are not surprising that you would expect, positive, constructive very religious views, the idea that the children have beautiful souls and that they need to be saved and that it's important to protect these kids from the devil and to teach them to be good. And, you know, also from mid 20th century and even earlier, just some really pragmatic ideas about child rearing. So, the statement that children learn through observation. And so that if you want a child to act with justice and charity and courtesy and reverence, then you need to act that way as well. And then some really pragmatic ideas, like the idea that you shouldn't badmouth some child's parents to that child, that that's going to create a really negative relationship. So that all sounds really modern, actually and really positive. But then also in this documentation and what we know, of course, from the stories that come out of these places is that there was this ever-present, incredibly rigid hierarchy of power. The priest was God, 
what the priest said went. You do not question the priest. The nuns had to be modest and, of course, they had to be good and, of course, they had to be charitable, but above all they had to be obedient and they had to be obedient to the priest. And the message, the explicit message that nuns needed to be silent, nuns needed to not question the priests, nuns needed not to make comments about the activities of priests in the houses, that was really extraordinary to see as clearly as I could see it. So what happened, of course, was despite all these really positive, explicit messages, you know, in practice, life at the orphanage was completely at odds. And there was this abusive treatment. And I think fundamentally, you know, at the sort of the grandest scale, what we can see is that when you have an organization that's predicated on these ideas of obedience and silence and the avoidance of scandal, then abuse can flourish and that predators will quite obviously identify such a place as a very sort of happy hunting ground for themselves. You've written about how by the time these stories came to your attention and you were learning about this world, that it was within a climate in which we're used to hearing about these scandals, sexual abuse within the Catholic Church, child abuse. But in the context of the peak of St. Joseph's in Vermont, at the peak of abuse in those walls, what would the belief of the day have been when it came to the church and its treatment of children? Would anyone have believed or expected that this was going on? No, no. I mean, this is a story about disbelief as much as it is about anything else, about the incredible power of disbelief. So, The time that I was able to get documentation and speak to people who had been at St. Joseph's ranged from the very late 1930s up into the 1970s when it closed. And actually it is a fascinating era because you can see at the start of that period in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s just the absolute refusal of people in the larger world to countenance the possibility that any of these things could occur, that none was anything other than pure goodness, that a priest might harm anyone in any way, just this absolute refusal to engage with that to the point where, of course, what happens is that the victims themselves, they find it really hard to believe themselves that what has happened to them has happened to them, that they have been harmed by these good people in some way. It's incredibly powerful and pervasive. But then what you started to see in the 60s and the 70s is just the small incursions inside that world and tiny ways in which it started to break down. There were stories about runaways from the home and they would be reported in the internal documents of this house. And, you know, in the earlier years, there would be statements about how, oh, these boys ran away and the police brought them back and they were punished and the police, you know, were very good. And obviously the sort of the implied notion that the police believed everything we said. But then in the 60s and the 70s, there were a few incidents where it even made it into the newsletter you know, read by all the staff in that house, this idea that some police had brought some boys back and that they'd actually had a bit of trouble convincing the police that one of the boys was in fact telling lies. And then they sort of said something like, luckily in the end, you know, we did and the police went away and scandal was avoided. But it was clear that it was starting to break down and that people in larger society, you know, were willing to consider what these kids were saying was true. It it took a really long time. There were a lot of stories that started to come out in the 90s and it wasn't until Spotlight in 2002 that that wave finally crashed upon the shore and people really started to understand that what all these people were saying was absolutely worth considering. Similarly to My last question, I suppose we are familiar with the idea of abuse at the hands of male priests and men within the church, but what can you tell me about the abuse from the nuns at these places? It strikes me that here in Australia, over in the US, around the world at that time, that there was so much cruelty as well from the women in these institutions. Yes, absolutely. That is so important and it's actually starting to change just now. Like just now people are starting to sort of begin to grapple with this idea. So 
the story of sex abuse in the Catholic Church was and has been for the last 10, 20 years primarily a story about priest sexual abuse. And it is certainly the case that within the church and across society, there are more male predators than female. But partly our belief about that now is an artifact of the disappearance of this history and the fact that this history has barely been told at all in the United States and is only really starting to be accepted and become more widespread and told here. And of course, in this history, these institutions were staffed largely by women And the abuse perpetrated by many of these women absolutely covers this whole spectrum. There was, as you say, just incredible cruelty, just really sad, terrible treatment of kids, words that stayed with people. I've spoken to people. You still remember word for word the cruel things that were said to them 60 years before, things that just broke their hearts. But there was physical abuse as well. These women were incredibly violent. Women can indeed be violent. And there was sexual abuse. And it's really hard for victims of the sexual abuse of women, people who have been sexually abused by nuns, because, you know, people often struggle with the fear of being disbelieved, but it's less accepted to be able to say, to own, particularly I think for men in many ways, that they were sexually abused by a nun. And I think partly that's because we have this sort of understanding of women as society's caretakers, as the ones who look after the children. And, you know, statistically, that's how it is. So, of course, it makes sense that we think that. But it becomes really difficult for victims. It becomes really problematic when it means that we're not grappling with the real history of these places and the abuse committed by women in them. I think in order for us to understand and grapple with what these children endured, it would be helpful to get a bit specific if you're comfortable. Can you talk to me about some of the worst incidents that you discovered? Yeah, sure. And I think it's really important actually to be explicit and to be straight about this. I mean, A lot of people who went through the orphanage system were abused, but a lot of people have been abused in their lives who were not in the orphanage system. When I first wrote about this in BuzzFeed News, that was published in 2018, and I heard from a lot of people afterwards, many people wrote to say that they'd felt validated by what was written in the article, and they hadn't spent any time in orphanages themselves, that they felt validated just because there was a frank discussion of the fact that abuse occurs. So the emotional abuse was incredibly cruel. And, you know, some people have said to me that that was the most painful thing that they've carried in their lives, just the contempt with which they were treated, just the horrible contempt with which they were treated. One woman who spent time at a place in Western Australia in Nazareth House told me one nun in particular there, and this is not uncommon, would actually enjoined the older girls to bully the younger girls. So there was this sort of horrific dynamic where these older girls, who were no doubt just trying to sort of stay safe themselves, would end up bullying these younger girls and would do things like hold their heads underwater, you know, waterboarding, right? Waterboarding of children because a nun tells you to do it. There was a woman I spoke to in Canada who was tied to a bed. And I spoke to people in the United States and other places who similarly were tied to beds. This woman was tied to a bed frame without a mattress. There was a bucket beneath her to catch her waist. A woman would come into the room once a day to feed her and she kind of would mix all the different food on the plate into sort of one gross slop and shove it in her mouth. So just the kind of stuff that you could imagine happening to political prisoners, to people held in jails in dictatorial regimes. And the sexual abuse, as I say, it was really widespread. There was creepy priests telling young girls that it was good what he was doing to them. It was good that he was fingering them or raping them because that was the way to God. He was a representative of God. So that kind of awful, manipulative, creepy abuse of kids in that way. You know, there was quite violent abuse of young boys, of them being 
raped by older boys because nuns were telling them to do that, of being raped with implements. How common was it for a child in an orphanage in this time to suffer abuse? Are we talking about a rare few that were singled out or was it widespread emotional, physical, sexual, that if you were a child in these places, you were going to be abused? It was not the case that if you're a child in these places, you were going to be abused, but it's not at all uncommon. It's not rare. And these are not the extreme stories. These are really common stories. So often the kids whose parents were still in some way quite visible or had some power were not abused. So in institutions where the mom or the mom and the dad would show up every weekend at the one visiting hour they allowed and there was just obvious visibility or some visibility into the place or perhaps, you know, there was often family connections between these families. So, you know, the girl at St. Joseph's who was the daughter of the priest's sister, you know, she was very unlikely to be abused the less connections these kids had to the outside world, the less other adults who were watching out for them in any way, and this was true for many of these kids, then the more it was that they were likely to suffer all kinds of abuse. And there was so much schooling that went on inside these places about covering up the abuse. You know, kids would be told explicitly, if you tell anyone then we're going to take you away from your family forever. If you tell anyone, then I will send you to, you know, the priest or the nun or whoever they were most terrified of. There was that explicit instruction to be quiet. And then kids were just hidden away sometimes too. I mean, there are stories of kids who were covered in bruises who were then hidden away in the infirmary and they weren't allowed to see their family until you could no longer see the evidence of the abuse. How much did these abusers rely then on the power of fear, you know, for the children who maybe weren't copying it every day but seeing their friends and the children around them suffering, the children who were abused but were then told, you know, all of the bad things that would befall them if they spoke out. How important was the role of fear? Yeah, fear was everything in these places. It was absolutely everything. So the kids who were being abused were afraid of the next time they were going to be abused. The kids who weren't perhaps abused themselves, but who saw other children just beaten to a pulp, who saw children picked up and thrown across rooms, who saw children bleeding profusely because of what had happened to them. Nothing needed to happen to those kids to fall into line. There seemed to be a psychology in these places where, you know, there would be the nun's pet, the teacher's pet, and sometimes that would be a whole group of, you know, the good girls. Even in adulthood, some of these people would end up defending the nuns or the priests, but when you spoke to them more closely, it was clear that they had actually witnessed these terrible things. I believe that certainly for some of these people, they were still frightened three decades later, four decades later, and unable to really judge what they had seen because they were so scared of what might have happened to them. I want to talk about the harrowing accounts of Sally Dale, a woman who lived in St. Joseph's in the US. Just one example of a life in one of these places. What can you tell me about Sally's life, what she endured? One of the most incredible things about Sally was the resilience of her spirit despite everything she endured. So I came to Sally because I interviewed the lawyer who represented a lot of the people who'd spent time at St. Joseph's in the 1990s. And when he met Sally, that was when he decided to take the case. She impressed him so profoundly with not just the horror of her stories, but this incredible quality of innocence and sincerity with which he told them. You know, he'd heard a lot of stories before that point. He met Sally and he was in. He knew it was real and he knew it was worth fighting for. And likewise, there was this amazing local journalist who covered a lot of this stuff in Burlington in the 1990s. He had carried Sally Dale with him for decades afterwards as well. So Sally just had this incredible quality of a realness of authenticity. And yet she somehow had developed that and retained that 
despite the fact that she went into St. Joseph's when she was about two years old and she didn't leave until she was 23. So her entire childhood and young adulthood had been shaped by the nuns and her experiences there. And, you know, I think just to give you a sense of what Sally's life was like, one of the first experiences she described first in the 1990s in this deposition, in this court case, and, you know, to these other people as well was being taken behind the orphanage, being walked across the yard by a nun one day. I think she was around six years old and she heard this crashing sound. It was the crashing of glass and she looked up and there was a boy above her in the air. And then shortly afterwards, he hit the ground in front of her and he had been thrown from a window. She looked up and she saw at a four-story window, there was a nun standing there. Her arms were pushed out and she had clearly thrown this boy from the window. So Sally was really young and this incident stayed with her and she was incredibly troubled by it. And it took her a couple of days to return to it and to say to the nun, is that boy okay? What happened to him? And the nun said something to her like, Sally, don't start with your imagination again. Do not raise this. So that was Sally's introduction to life at the orphanage. And, you know, it didn't get a lot better from that point on. And yet she is just this incredible person who, despite this Dickensian life with these pockets of abuse and these moments of real horror, she was a heroine. She survived it. She maintained the integrity of her own reality throughout that time. She couldn't explain a lot of these things, but she didn't doubt herself. She knew that they'd really happened. That made her just an incredible subject for the book. We have stories like Sally's stories as told by these survivors, but of course, many didn't. How much do we know about those orphans who might have lost their lives either in the home or perhaps later in life as a result of their trauma? So in the early 2000s, there was an inquiry called Forgotten Australians. And that was the first time, I believe, anywhere in the world and certainly here in Australia, the federal government devoted the time and the resources to investigating what life was like in these places and what life had been like for people after these places. And that inquiry found that there was a shocking number of deaths amongst this group of people, early deaths, deaths by suicide, different kinds of deaths. There was a lot of illness. There was a lot of disability. And of course, there was massive disadvantage. There was also a really high proportion of challenges with addiction of some kind as well. And you you can imagine the kind of self-medication that, you know, people had to do in order to survive after going through something like that and then coming out to the world where there was no support for them, let alone any acknowledgement of what they'd really been through. The impact of these places was incredibly harmful. I believe that that pattern is the same for the United States. What I found in this one orphanage in Burlington, Vermont, was very similar. What people I could track down the people who'd been there in the 60s and 70s usually told me about someone they knew who'd been at the orphanage who had since died or a number of people they'd known who had since died either in a violent fashion or by suicide or died young in some way. The burden of that kind of trauma without any social support that anyone could survive it is incredible. That The people who did is amazing. For the people who did, How did they transition into life after these orphanages? What are some of the aftershocks? You know, we've sort of touched on addiction, mental health issues. How do you go from growing up in a space like that to living freely in the community? I still think about that. I still wonder about that. What I can tell you is that for a lot of people, the way to cope was to never tell anyone where there had been or what had happened to them. The stigma was just so profound. There are so many stories of people who didn't tell a soul until their 50s or even their 60s that they had even been in an orphanage, let alone what had happened to them in there. And the really incredible story about the activists in Australia who started to organise in the 1990s is that 
they were the ones to sort of first break that silence. One of the co-founders put ads in local newspapers across the country and people responded to them, you know, did you ever spend time in an orphanage? And I spoke to one man who answered that ad and who went and spoke to a woman at this organization. It's called CLAN, Care Leavers Australasia Network. And the experience he had that day was so beautiful. He was asked by someone, her name is Leonie Sheedy, and she had also spent time in institutions. So she knew, he could tell she was authentic. She knew what she was talking about. And she asked him about his experience and he told him about what happened to her. And, you know, he said to me that when he walked out that day, he felt like Jesus Christ walking on water. He felt like Superman flying. It was just this unbelievable burden that had been lifted from him just to even say. And after that incredible moment, he decided to tell his wife, the woman he'd been married to for decades, where he'd actually been and what had actually happened to him. And, you know, and then it became this story in his family that he shared the story with his children and with his grandchildren as well. So that is the first and most powerful tool just to never, ever talk about it. But that doesn't always work. And even when it does work, it can be incredibly isolating and costly not to talk about this as well. So some very lucky people found individuals who believed them. They were able to tell their story. They were able to get some validation and have that kind of witnessing. And then in places like Australia where people started to organize and gather in groups together, that can be incredibly healing as well. And I've seen that just start to happen in the United States. But what's really critical for healing is that the rest of the community acknowledges as well that this is still an ongoing story and it still needs to happen. People need to understand that their history will be respected, that it won't be forgotten, that it will be told. That pattern of victim survivors keeping these secrets for so many years. What does that tell us about what you've described as a matrix of corroboration between orphanages, the power and influence of how they were organised in perpetrating abuse and instilling fear and terror in these children well into adulthood? When I started to think about this matrix or mesh of corroboration that just combined all these stories, that connected all these stories across the world. It was because I kept coming across individuals who hadn't told their story to anyone else, or maybe just a few people, and they would tell me their story. And, you know, I sort of had this awful experience of listening to them, of believing them, but also some part of me feeling like this cannot possibly be true. This is so awful. How could this have happened? But then what would happen is that the more I spoke to people from different places, the more I had the experience that these individuals who barely told anyone else, let alone were even aware that there were other orphanages in the world, they were telling me the same story. And in some cases, it was exactly the same stories. One very common and incredibly cruel experience a lot of these kids suffered was that they were punished explicitly for wetting the bed. You know, a lot of kids have issues with wetting the bed. It is completely normal human behavior. And it's also the case that kids who end up in these institutions, who are taken from their families, who are very frightened that this is going to happen more rather than less. But In these places across the world, kids were punished for wetting the bed and they were punished in very specific ways. It was often the case that, you know, they would get up the next morning, the nun or the caretaker would drape these wet sheets around the child and then they were made to parade through the dormitory or up and down the hall and the nun would enjoin all the other kids to jeer and laugh at this poor child. This just happened all over the place. And these people who sort of haven't really told their stories, they tell the same story. So there's this incredible corroborating collection of stories that are the same. And it's also the case that with stories that, you know, perhaps I only heard once or twice, there was this corroboration in kind. So when I heard a story about a child being perhaps 
pushed down the stairs or punched in the face. I struggled sometimes to really cope with the idea that that had occurred. But then I would hear a story in another place about a child being tied down to the bed for days at a time or a child being locked in a cupboard or a box. And, you know, once you hear one of these stories, it becomes a lot easier to accept the likelihood that the others occurred as well because they're the same kind of cruelty and also the same lack of oversight in all these places. It was clear that all these adults in these places were able to do these things without anyone telling them otherwise. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with Christine Keneally about the systemic abuse of children in church-led orphanages throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. We've spoken a little bit about the community that began to gain momentum here in Australia throughout the 90s in terms of victim survivors beginning to share and corroborate and take action. What sort of reckoning did we see in Australia? Can you take me through the Royal Commission? Yeah, so... These individuals and then eventually this group started to organise and agitate and fight for this right to be heard after all these years. And that resulted initially in the early 2000s with this federal inquiry into the Forgotten Australians. And there had also been an inquiry into the child migrant situation. This is very much a similar overlapping story where children from England and Scotland were shipped here. To Australia, they often didn't know why they were sent here and they ended up in these orphanages as well. So they were here in these orphanages with kids who were also born here as well. And of course, there's a huge overlap with the stolen generation as well. So all these Indigenous kids who were taken from their families, some of them ended up in these urban orphanages, others spent time in these mission schools but often it was the same kinds of staff, the same kinds of treatment, the same kind of incarceration. So there began to be these federal inquiries. So that was the first and sort of most important beginning inquiry. And then there were state inquiries as well. There was a report in Queensland. There was another investigation by the Victorian state government. This all contributed to and accumulated in the most recent Royal Commission into institutional abuse. That inquiry included people who'd spent time in institutions, but it was actually, it extended out across different kinds of institutions as well. You know, there were swim schools, there were parish schools, other organizations like that. So Australia's done actually a pretty incredible job at grappling with this history, at creating the documentation that validates these stories and that enables the history to live, you know, going into the future that allows historians and scholars and just the general public to really accept that this happened and to understand it. With the reckoning or lack of, I suppose, in the US, how have they come to terms as a nation with this history in their orphanages? They absolutely have not come to terms with this history. This is just the most extraordinary situation in which this massive chunk of 20th century history is just absolutely missing from the history books in the United States and is not understood by the general public because they're not even really aware. So we are hopefully at the beginning of a renaissance in that understanding In Vermont, in Burlington, when my BuzzFeed News article came out, you know, and some of that reporting, of course, ends up in my book, Goes to the Orphanage. In response to that article, the state attorney general launched a criminal investigation and he launched a restorative justice process as well. The criminal investigation was really important and it performed some of the same functions as the inquiries, the government inquiries do here. It listened to the victims representatives from law enforcement spoke to the survivors. They respectfully took down their stories. They corroborated what had happened to them and they validated this reality. And really importantly, they also said, we should have done better. We didn't do the right thing. This should never have happened to you and we will never let this happen again. 
The restorative justice process was an incredibly important process too because survivors came together and they spent time thinking about what they wanted to see, the changes that they wanted to see, and they've made extraordinary changes. The survivors of St. Joseph contributed to the repeal of the statute of limitations on childhood sexual abuse with civil litigation in the United States. That was massive. There are other states that have done that, but there's not enough. But what they also did, and this is solely attributable to them, they lobbied so that the statute of limitations on childhood physical abuse for civil litigation was also repealed. That is a first in the United States. That's just an incredible historic accomplishment, but it's just Vermont and they're the first. So this needs to happen across the country at the same time. And certainly from all the correspondence that I still receive from people who've read just the BuzzFeed article, those stories are out there. You know, the historians need to step in. The scholars need to do their work. And all the history needs to be recovered. Some of that history was recovered or revealed for the first time by former residents of St. Joseph's in Vermont in the 90s. What can you tell me about the lawsuits brought by those former residents of the orphanage? I know Sally Dale, who we've touched on, was among them. How significant was that time? It was incredibly significant. So across the world in the 1990s, individuals who'd been in these places started to come out to themselves about what had happened to them. They started telling some people close to them and some of them started to organize and agitate. And in Australia and in other countries, that energy often got funneled into appeals to government bodies. And the responses were these inquiries and investigations. In the United States, a lot of that energy went towards civil litigation. The challenge with civil litigation, of course, is that it's a huge combative process. And it's often the case that the wealthiest party does well out of something like that because they just have more resources to outlast that process, that really arduous process. So it was an incredibly difficult process for these people to participate in. Many of them just had incredibly overwhelming PTSD. They were still really affected in these very challenging ways by the things that had happened to them. They found support with each other, but they didn't necessarily have a lot of support from the community at large. And the Catholic Church was very well moneyed and very well resourced. And during that process, it did many of the things that we're now familiar with, with this kind of process with the church. They stonewalled people. They undermined them. They smeared the victims. They suggested that actually they were just lying and making stuff up. So it was incredibly costly. And ultimately it failed because everyone settled and they settled for a very small amount of money. And one of the reasons they settled was because they just couldn't keep going in the way that they were without any real support or true social validation. But even though they had done that and they'd done that at great cost to themselves, by participating in that process, they generated this mountain of documentation. You know, there were depositions taken. There were videos taken of deposition statements. There were diaries entered into discovery. There were photographs. So that was mid-1990s. I came along in the late 20-teens A lot of that had been sort of broken up and scattered and flung far and wide, but it was possible to try to piece a lot of that puzzle together. And because all those individuals had come forward and had spoken their truth in the 90s, that's the only thing that enabled me to come along in the 20 teens and really try to dig this story up again. And it was the only thing that really enabled the state attorney general and their restorative justice people to do their work as well. What is it about these caregivers, these nuns or priests, whoever it was working in these places, people who are supposed to be protecting children, is there a thread that you've seen in their mindset, their abuse, their entitlement? Were there any staff actually trying to take care of these kids? Yeah, there were. And that's another really fascinating common thread in this mesh of corroboration, which is that 
you know, people from different orphanages across the world will say to you, yeah, there were good people. They just didn't last long. People would go into these places just because they were basic, ordinary good people, or, or maybe they particularly wanted to do good. But the system was such that it wasn't possible for them to stay, or they were explicitly kicked out because they tried to make trouble for the abusers. But then as far as the psychology of the people in those places who are abusive, I think because it was a really complicated world, there were really different kinds of people. Like there were people who were just straight out sociopaths, who were just terrible, abusive adults who clearly enjoyed the power they had over children. There were people who were maybe not particularly good or bad, who were just trying to do their job. And it was actually a really difficult system to work in where other adults were being abusive. You know, a lot of these children, they were distressed. They weren't supported. They must have been upset, you know, a reasonable amount of the time. And so these adults just couldn't cope and they were abusive situationally, but they certainly hadn't gone into a place like this in order to be abusive. I think also, particularly in the case of the nuns, And, you know, there are so many stories, not just of nuns being abusive, but of nuns colluding in some way with abusive priests, you know, either at best turning a blind eye to their obvious abuse or actually delivering children to them. I think for these women, they were just terrified. I think they were very obedient soldiers in an army led by God, who was their local priest. And they did what they were told and they were really scared of what would happen to them if they didn't. Have you spoken to any of those nuns who have been accused of perpetrating some of this abuse? Yes. I looked for so many of them. I spent so much time trying to track these women down. I mean, obviously they were older than many of the kids. So by the time I found a trace of many of them, they had since died But I did finally track down one woman who was the nun from a a really well corroborated story by two women. She'd been accused of trying to push a girl out a window at the orphanage. And, you know, she opened her door to me. She was this lovely little old lady. She was incredibly sweet. She was happy to talk about the old days. So we spoke about her time there. She'd since left her order and she told me about deciding not to be a nun anymore. She'd clearly been pressured into it by her family. And it wasn't until she was 60 years old that she'd had the courage to push back against her own mother and saying, no, let me live the life that I want to live. You know, when we started talking about the abuse and I started asking her those questions, there was a lot of denial, but some of the reality came through nevertheless. And I think in her mind, it was a different era. There were different rules. And I think at some really basic level, they felt justified and she felt justified as well. Did she give you the impression that she had a sense or a grasp of what it was that had happened to children in her care? Do you think that denial is maybe a coping mechanism or that just genuinely there's something in her that thought it was okay? I'm not sure if the coping mechanism becomes the reality or or vice versa, but certainly the denial was pretty much complete. And I think that kind of that dehumanization that we were speaking about at the start, the dehumanization of these children, and that justifies all sorts of things when you don't see these kids as quite real or quite good enough or not the same as those other kids out there in the world who have real parents. I think you can justify an awful lot of terrible things when you don't see a person, and in these cases, these children, as just quite as human with as many rights as everyone else. What was it like for you sitting across from her face-to-face with a nun, you know, after hearing all these harrowing stories of abuse and then witnessing that denial? How did you feel? Was it frustrating, shocking? Take me to that place. It was frustrating 
it was frustrating. It was clear to me there was a point where I hit a wall with her and I wasn't going to get any further. And that was so tough because she was actually one of the last witnesses of this particular incident and this particular era. And I was just so desperate to just really get a sense of what it was like then. And I I wanted to understand what it was like from her perspective. I wanted to get a sense of how it felt to her and how one thing had led to another and, and how the situation had unfolded from her perspective. That drove me kind of crazy. Yeah. 10 years of research went into your book. When you embarked on this journey, Christine, did you ever imagine that it was going to take up so much of your life? No, absolutely not. I had no idea. And I think with every year that passed, still didn't have any idea until the day I handed my book in. The incredible thing about it is it took that long. It took that long. I mean, finding all the pieces of the puzzle, gathering all the stories from people across the world, recombining these parts of the story that had been smashed and scattered. And it really takes a long time to bring something together that has been so profoundly suppressed or even smashed and actively repressed. But I think the reality is to, you know, what I've done here is the tip of the iceberg and going forward There is so much for young journalists, for young scholars, young historians to get in there and to find more of this story before it's too late. Have we seen enough change or reform to ensure that these kinds of places can't hurt children anymore? Has anyone been held to account for the abuse? Not enough. There have been really important processes that have happened, the inquiries in Australia, the investigations in Vermont, the restorative justice process. These are really important beginnings and organizations like Clan in Australia do get some support. That's really important. They've had enough support recently to open Australia's first orphanage museum. So the tide is starting to turn in that way. But, you know, whenever there's formal inquiries, whenever there's investigations, it is really commonly the case that the perpetrators or the remnants of these institutions, the organisations that once historically ran these institutions, you know, they could come to the table a lot faster than they do. They could engage a lot more actively than they do. And some of them absolutely are still dragging their heels and making it difficult for people to get the kind of restoration and restitution and compensation they deserve. My last question for you, how did some of these places fall apart? How were they liberated, I suppose, if any of these kids were? And what's the legacy, the learnings? You know, there were these huge cultural changes that were happening sort of from the mid 20th century. And in the 60s, Vatican II, which was an attempt to accommodate the changing world of the 60s, the sort of the growing sexual liberation and social liberation and the beginnings of the empowerment of women, in many ways spelled the end of the church as it was. So a lot of women left their religious orders. The numbers of nuns just sank precipitously. And the many women who in previous generations would have joined did not. So there just wasn't this replacement as well. So this aging demographic of nuns, which ran these Catholic institutions, just shrank, just got smaller and smaller. And so their power became less and less. Those social changes that, you know, we were talking about too, they started to affect people's expectations of their local priest, of their institutions, So I don't think there were any breaks in the good sense that were ever put on. I don't think anyone ever came in and said, this is wrong, this needs to change, this needs to fix. I think there was this just increasing number of incursions from the outside world that disrupted the power structures in these places and this sort of just decay and decrepitude, this empire essentially slowly but surely falling apart and then eventually closing partly as that deinstitutionalization occurred across the country and across different institutions as well. What the learning is from these places is that 
you can't disappear a huge chunk of history and you can't disappear the experiences of millions of people across the world and not pay some kind of really important price for that. And that's not just in terms of just the absolute injustice of these people going through the experiences they did and never getting the validation and the restitution that they deserve. What it also means is that, you know, we just evolved into this foster care system, into these ideas about childcare that just aren't based on the reality of where we've been historically. And if we really want to be sure we're doing the right thing going forward, not just in terms of making restitution to people who've suffered trauma and injustice, but as best as possible, making sure that it can't happen again to kids, we need to be real about what the history is. Thanks to Christine for her assistance in telling these stories. And if you'd like to learn more about her findings, you'll find a link to Christine's book, The Ghosts of the Orphanage, in the episode description. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Emma Gillespie. From world-class podcasts to events, videos and articles, a Mamma Mia subscription gives you unlimited access to powerful stories you won't hear anywhere else. All for as little as $5.75 a month. You can learn more in the episode description. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.